Today I have something very specific on my mind. I reflected today, yesterday, actually this week, on some of my friends that have been wounded. I re-injured myself just a few days ago doing something. It's quite simple, actually. And it's an injury that came from a previous injury. And my ability to move quickly and to be mobile significantly mobile, has been impaired for a few days. And under these circumstances, I reflected about one of my friends, a dear friend named Jeff. I will hold his last name. I actually have two combat veteran buddies named Jeff. This guy specifically used to come to the Urban Warfare Center when I ran it, and he even helped teach a couple times with us. And he was a former member of the 19th Special Forces Group, He was not a tabbed-out Special Forces soldier, but he was very capable. In fact, he had been given the Bronze Star with a V, which is for valor, for pulling some of his bodies out of a firefight under fire. So I met Jeff at the Urban Warfare Center and began a great relationship with him. Jeff became a contractor in the War on Terror, went to Afghanistan. Uh, He had been to Iraq. And as a private security detail operator... They're called PSD. He was guarding some dignitaries and was in and around a large school bus. And an IED, improvised explosive device, went off really close to where he was and decimated the bus. And it was a sad story. And Jeff was on an opposite side of a concrete barrier, but had received much of the blast. And it pretty much compressed his body. And what happens under severe explosions is that your organs are hollow and your body is made of 70% water. And so there's this compression and then the reverse happens. And that can kind of be the cause of death at times because it can rupture things inside of our body and cause us to bleed out or traumatize the organs, the heart, the brain. And so Jeff was wounded severely and came home. And I saw him several months later when he was back in Utah and he was recovering. And he came to my work, the business that I owned, where he used to teach. And he was different. He was quiet. And it looked like the fire had been taken from him. You know, my my wife and I are watching this show called from Masterpiece Theater called World on Fire. And there's this gentleman inside the movie who's a World War I veteran and He's severely traumatized. They used to call it shell shock during and after the war. And now we call it PTSD. And there was a word that was used in an episode recently that defining some of these men as weak or cowards. And I I try not to be offended by that, but deeply inside I am when I know people like Jeff and my good friend John from the UK who was blown up in Tunisia. My good friend Jeff, the other Jeff, Jeff S., Versus Jeff P. Jeff P. is the one that got blown up in Afghanistan. Uh, Jeff S. got involved in other government agency activities in Afghanistan and Iraq. And after he was an Army veteran and went through this program that I went through, he caught and killed many bad guys and was wounded in a different way. I remember he called me from Afghanistan one day. I'm in the middle of Utah and... He says, David, I, I don't know what to do. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I have a, a quadruple amputee in front of me right now. And his mates are telling me to let him die, giving him too much, give him too much morphine and let him go. And he goes, what do I do? And I said, I, what do you, good grief. You know, what do you say to something like that? I, I told him, I said, I do not have the answer, but I do know this. I think that he should have the opportunity to decide that. And right now he's in no position to decide that. You have to save his life and let him determine his future as much as possible. Difficult circumstances. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of, and this isn't meant to be a dark, macabre podcast, but there's a tremendous amount of respect and love and affirmation I have for my mates and people that I know that have been wounded in combat or conflict, law enforcement officers, military personnel, rescue personnel. There was a a guy 
on the search and rescue team in Rapid City. When the flood hit, I think it was in 1972, early 70s, the dam broke and killed over 200 people in Rapid City. The, the water just came right through the city and just devastated it. And over 200 deaths. And this guy was being suspended in a house that had collapsed under mud with a rope around his waist. And, you know, not the best technique, but the rope had, a, had slipped in the slip knot and had constricted his abdominal cavity. And at the time I met him when I was on the team in Rapid City, I learned about his issue. And, you know, we're talking about a volunteer organization and his life was changed forever. He had multiple surgeries, never quite right. My uncle served in Korea. His name is Bill Olson and he's passed now. He was 17 when he joined the Marine Corps, became a member of the 1st Marine Division, was involved in every major conflict with the 1st Marine Division for the three years the Korean War happened on the peninsula before the treaty was signed or the ceasefire was signed. And came back an old 20-year-old. He was married to my mother's sister, my Aunt Barbara, and they divorced after a few years. But Uncle Bill was one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet, but Uncle Bill would never talk about the war. And Uncle Bill would never tell you war stories. And Uncle Bill w would never show memorabilia from the war. He raised three sons, and one of my dearest friends in the world is one of them. He's six weeks apart from me in age and probably one of my best friends on earth. And his older two brothers are also my brothers. They're not my cousins, they're my brothers. And they didn't really know much about Uncle Bill from his war experiences, but they knew that Uncle Bill had been in the war. And there was a few times when he shared a few things. Turns out that Uncle Bill, as a young Marine, one time was on the line and a little girl came into their lines and they used to often put explosive devices on these kids and send them into the American lines and have them detonate uh, killing as many Marines or, or soldiers as possible. And the sergeant was telling Uncle Bill to shoot her. And he did. He didn't want to. He hesitated, but he did. Turned out she was strapped and ready to go with explosives on her. Because of that, he had a hard time having a relationship with his daughter. And she never knew why that was the case. And I heard this story from her, actually. When Uncle Bill died, his sons found that in his house that he had in Mexico, his retreat, that it was filled like a Marine Corps shrine. Captured enemy flag, pictures, photos, memorabilia from the war. And it was all held in his private dwelling where he could see it and remember the loved and the lost and the fallen, but didn't have to expose it to the world. And I think it's, a, it's another illustration of how we need to pay reverence and homage, ex exercise extreme compassion and love. These men and women are not weak. They are broken because of what they've seen and done in many ways. And they will never be what we would call normal. And somebody who's a smart aleck might say to me, well, what is normal? And I'll tell you, you know, normal is when you haven't drunk from the bitter cup and you've lived a life where you've gone to a nine-to-five job and you've gotten sick a few times here and there, maybe broke a limb, but you haven't had somebody hunt you to kill you, and you haven't hunted to kill others. Or you haven't gone to the depths of the abyss to recover a dead body under severe circumstances wherein your life is in peril. You haven't crossed over nuclear meltdowns and recovered bodies in a really horrific environment, and you haven't done those things, and that's okay. You don't have to. It doesn't prove that you're a better person or not. But because you haven't, you have, there's an element of normality that you experience. And those people that have done these hard things, law enforcement officers that have been on the street and have had to tell somebody that somebody's passed or, or, or dealt with suicide, and all these other difficult things, or having a partner get shot or injured, um, are very traumatic experiences. Uh, one more quick story. I have a dear friend of mine when I was in England. His name was John. 
B. I won't give you his last name. We were in a very sensitive role in our base. I was in charge of communications at one point in time on the base as a staff sergeant. And we would get special operations forces in three to four times a year from NATO. Uh, Israel would come, uh, the SAS, pararescue, combat control, TACP, everybody would come. SEAL teams would come. Delta had been there, the unit guys, the Army Special Forces. We'd get a couple of the groups, a 10th group out of Europe and another group out of the East Coast of the United States would come. And we would participate in a mission called Flintlock. And it was counterinsurgency and counterterrorism in the 1980s and right up until 1990. And then Saddam went into Kuwait. That mission was canceled. It happened for three years previously, three, four times a year. This would happen for four to six weeks at a time. So we were in a base that was classified. It wasn't on Google Maps. Uh, it still exists today. Uh, most, much of the land has been sold off the um, housing areas. But the flat line and the command post and... Air traffic control tower is still there and still used occasionally, from what I hear. But in the late 80s, this was a classified covert operation that was taking place. And my dear friend, who was another communications guy, who worked alongside, we worked alongside each other in this, this special operations support role. He actually went to hostage rescue school with me. I got him in on that when I connected to the folks who were going to run that program and graduated I did very well. He got blown up in Tunisia. He got blown up when he was in Tunisia with his wife on a vacation in the 1980s, 1988 actually. If you look in Google, you'll see some stuff in Tunisia in the 1980s, blowing up hotels and all this kind of stuff. I don't know that this one ever made it into the mainstream press because it was buried pretty deeply. But basically there were some West, Western Europeans on a bus outside of Tunis, and I had warned John before he went, because we had access to a lot of intelligence. I said, why are you going? Don't go. You know, it's dangerous. We already know that the sit reps are saying that, you know, they're looking to kill Westerners. But he did it. He went with his wife and, you know, didn't have a death wish or anything, but wanted to see ancient Carthage and Tunis and all these places in the North African area, which is very in, in, intriguing and very compelling. And when he was on the bus with his wife, a bomb exploded from the bottom of the bus, blew up into the bus, and broke every major bone in his legs and his feet. He got his wife out of the burning bus. He hit the ground when he came out the window and moved about 50 feet and collapsed. Interesting things happen under adrenaline that you're able to do superhuman things and then realize you know you don't have the structure to continue doing it. His wife was severely burned in her lower extremities, but John was in bad shape. And John laid on the ground for three days in a Tunisian hospital. They wouldn't even give him a bed because he was an American. They took his camera when they got on scene, the police, the military, whomever, ripped his film out. And they told everybody that the air conditioning unit on top of the bus had exploded. And that's what happened. And it was an accident. Truth be told... Yasser Arafat took responsibility for the incident and a series of hotels blew up after that in the Tunisia area, killing Westerners. John was affected by this severely because he wanted to become a combat controller and he was working towards that. As a matter of fact, he got a recommendation letter from our commander after finishing hostage rescue school to that end. And John was now not able to do that and probably not able to stay in the service so he thought, and so he was told, because he couldn't walk. But I watched this guy, side by side, for a year and a half, rehabilitate, work towards walking, and eventually running. Interestingly enough, I remember when John came back from one of his hospital visits, he used to have to go to RAF Lakenheath. I was at a base called RAF Skullthorpe, which was up north, about 60 clicks. And Lincoln Heath was our host base where the medical facilities were. We had a small clinic with a phenomenal medic at our location. It was called Operating Location Alpha. And John came back and he had cut the toes off of his boots. We had, similar to Danner boots, we had these Matterhorn boots that are kind of a nice special operations boot. 
They have a nice uh, weatherproof interior, and they're just phenomenal for rucking and climbing and operating. And he cut the toes off these things so that the pins sticking out of his toes, which were trying to put his toes back together, he could wear a boot with the pins in his toes. I mean, it was a gruesome sight. And then John decided he would start to try to run after months of rehabilitation. And everyone was like, you're crazy, dude. You're not going to be able to do it. You know, I was with John after one and a half years when he ran his mile and a half under the time allotted to keep him in the United States Air Force. He retired as a senior master sergeant. I lost contact with him when I left Europe. And last thing I heard a few years ago, he was working in Europe and another government job, very classified environment and doing really well. John was in constant pain all the years that I knew him and suffered tremendously from, from his ailments. He could have taken a retirement. He could have taken a medical and exited. And, you know, I've met many people who have a knee injury or, you know, hurt their pinky or their big toe and take 10 or 20 percent or 30 percent from the government for the rest of their life and exit the scene. And those injuries occurred while they were either running or lifting weights or something else and were not related to operating or training or anything like that. And I'm not mocking or belittling those folks, but I am saying that there's a difference between Jeff P., who was blown up in Afghanistan, and Jeff S., who was severely traumatized by capturing and killing many high-valued targets, and John B., my dear best buddy, who was blown up while on vacation by terrorists in Tunisia. My Uncle Bill, who was wounded multiple times by shrapnel and all kinds of things and never got a Purple Heart, never even submitted for it because it just wasn't what you did. And I respect that. And just because he didn't have a Purple Heart didn't want to get it because of whatever reason doesn't mean he didn't warrant it or deserve it. And those that have it don't deserve it. They do. My last story is about a dear friend named Tony And Tony is one of my favorite people on earth. And he is a former rescue officer. And he finally retired as a major. Took him years to get his disability. He was blown up by a couple of Iranian rockets that hit his base in Iraq. The first one, he was rendering aid to people in a shower facility area that had been hit, saving lives when the second one hit. Severely wounded, he was treated and years and years went by and he ended up with TBI, traumatic brain injury, which is a compression injury of the brain. That is, like I talked about earlier, some things that happen under extreme compression of the air and then expansion of the air when a large explosion goes off. And to this day, he fights it every single day. He has a mantra that he uses that says, do the work. And you might see me post that on some of my Instagram stuff and do the work because he does all these therapies. He's very engaged. He he builds guitars. He he's just, he teaches at a counter terror school. He used to at least. He runs his own private security business, bodyguards, billionaires, just a really engaged, accomplished, successful man who went through severe conflict was wounded severely and hasn't given up. I guess the reason I shout this out today is because my heart's a little tender for these men, the women, who have been wounded. Whether they're recipients of the Purple Heart or not, they are recipients of my undying respect, loyalty, love, and honor. You know, a lot of people have said that the only heroes are the ones that are dead, and Well, I believe there's some truth to that. There's another line of heroes that exist, and these are the walking wounded. Whether emotionally wounded or physically wounded or disabled, they have laid it all on the line. As I close, I'm reminded of Desert Storm, preceded by Desert Shield. I was in Europe at the time. I was working communications and then inherited a security detail to provide protection for the families and the facilities, the munitions on our base that were being loaded up to be dropped on Iraq at the time during Desert Storm. 
And I remember the first fatality of Desert Shield was an American Air Force staff sergeant who was working on the flight line on aircraft and was run over by a truck at night and killed. You know, he didn't charge up Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima and raise the American flag. He was simply working on a flight line, doing whatever he was doing, and was killed. And to his family, it doesn't matter how it happened. He's gone, and they'll never get him back. So for those of you who have drunk from the bitter cup or are still on the line, whether it's EMS, law enforcement, military, I salute you. My hat's off to you. You have my undying loyalty, love, support, and I honor you. I hope you all have a great day, and I hope that Memorial Day comes more frequently than once a year for you. As you find time to not be overwhelmed by it, as you pause and give respect and homage to those who have given all.